Welcome to week six of what on earth am I here for? I pray these last five weeks have been so encouraging to you. I just trust that you built some amazing group relationships and dynamics. And, and I want to make this suggestion. Matter of fact, why don't next, next week, instead of just um, of not coming back to group, why don't you guys just plan something together? Maybe put a little potluck together, come back and celebrate these amazing things you've discovered. Maybe give some highlights of, of how it meant, or what it meant to you and how you've uh, grown in these last six weeks. I definitely would love to hear what God is doing in your life. And you can send me something directly at my story at changingpoint.com. It will come directly to my office. I'll be able to receive exactly what God's done. And here's what I promise you. If you'll send me your growth, if you'll send me your story, I promise I'll pray for you. Continue to believe God. And if there's anything I can do to help you in, in your journey, I will do that. So again, congratulations for making it all six weeks. Thank you for being here. The final thing I'd like to, for you to consider before I start a session is this. How has small group been for you? Have you built good relationships? Does this feel good? You know why it feels good? Because you were designed for small group. If this small group that you're in today maybe doesn't continue, there are definitely groups at Changing Point Church that continue on. And maybe it's something that you can be a part of. Talk to your small group leader, the host group leader, and see how they can help you connect to an ongoing small group that will help you live out your complete purpose and what you were designed for. Man, well, if you're ready, we're gonna start with a quick recap. What we discussed our first week was the three questions of significance and why we were here. And then week number two, we went into our first uh, purpose. You were planned for God's pleasure. God loved you to have you love him back. What we call that is worship. We were designed or purposed for worship. Then our, our second uh, purpose we discovered was that we were formed for God's family and that God wants us to do something amazing to be because he adopted us into his family to be with amazing people. We call that purpose fellowship. Then the third purpose that we discovered was that we were created to become like Christ and God wanted to form us and, and the things that happened to us that are challenging weren't to destroy us or to bring us down, but rather to get away from the things that were holding us down so that we can get higher in life as we become more like Christ. We call that discipleship. And then finally, uh, last week, we talked about being shaped to serve. And that purpose we call ministry. Every one of us has a place to live out our talent, our gift set in God's house and in God's kingdom. And I pray that that continue to become clear to you as you move forward. Then today, as we deal with the fifth mission, the fifth purpose that we were all created for, the fifth a purpose we were created for is you were made for a mission. You were made for a mission. In John chapter 17, verse 17, the Bible says this, in the same way that you gave me a mission in this world, I give them a mission. That's Jesus speaking to God about his disciples. So God gave Jesus a mission, and guess what? Jesus gave you and I a mission. We call that evangelism. What is the difference between your ministry and your mission? What is my ministry? What is my mission? I'm glad you asked. Your ministry is to the church, but your mission is to the world. Your ministry is for believers, those people you congregate on Sunday, those people that come to small group or those people that, you know, you see on a Sunday morning event, that nature. But your mission is to those who are unbelievers, those who don't know Christ and haven't come to know Jesus Christ as their savior as of yet. That's why it's our mission. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24 goes on to say this. The most important thing is that I complete my mission, the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. Two parts to life on mission. So two parts to your life mission. So number one, God expects me. Are you ready? God expects me to bring people. What? Yeah. Yeah, God expects us to bring people to Jesus. Aside from your own character, the only thing you will ever take to heaven is the people you have brought to Jesus Christ. Here's a question. Is anybody going to heaven because of you? And if you haven't asked yourself that question, maybe this is a good time. Is anybody going to heaven because of me. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 5 would go on to say this, work at bringing others to Christ. It's not easy. 
Well, for some of us, it's easier than others, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily easy. But here's what Timothy offers up. He says, work at bringing other people to Christ. Well, Pastor Eli, I mean, I, I don't know how to do that. How, how do I build a bridge? How do I help you? Well, we build a bridge to the people in our life by finding something in common with them. It's not as difficult as we, we like to make it out, and it sure is not as super spiritual and scary as some people might make it. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22 says this, whatever a person is like, I try to find a common ground with him so that he will let me in and tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22 in the Living Bible. What Whatever a person is like, I try to find, underline this word right here, underline this, common ground, common ground. If you would just get better at finding common ground with the people that God put in your world, I promise you, it would be much easier to bring people to Jesus. Now, now, a lot of us are thinking, you know, man, do I got to bring them to a small group? Well, that's a place. But remember that ministry is to the people who are believers, But mission is for the people who are not believers. What do you like to do when you're not at church? Because I know you love to be at church and I know you love to be a small group. But what do you like to do? Are you a biker? Do you like to uh, play golf? Are you a craft kind of gal? You do all these crafts. Are you a baker? Are you uh, what is it that you love to do? So a matter of fact, do me a favor on your paper somewhere. Go ahead and make a list of five things you enjoy doing. Just go ahead and write them down. One, two, three, four, five. I like to Bah, bah, bah. Make it good and decent, all right? Don't be saying weird stuff. Okay, so what are five things that you would like to do? Okay, now here's the question I'm going to ask you for this list as you're writing down these five things. What are the five people in your world who don't know Christ that you could invite to do these things with you? You're going to golf on Friday. Why not invite somebody who doesn't know the Lord? Find something in common. Uh, You're going to go to the theater next Friday because you know the great movies coming out, X, Y, and Z. Why don't you invite somebody to the theater who, who, who doesn't know Christ? So using that common ground, you can begin to look for an opportunity to share Christ. Don't get weird. It doesn't have to be weird. Just go out there with an expectation and start working out a way to share your love with Christ. Find something common and share the uncommon love of Jesus with them, and you'll see that God will use you to bring people to Christ. Now, here's the second one. The second one is God expects me to go to people for Jesus. God expects me to go to people for Jesus. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6 and verse 15, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. I know sometimes we feel like sharing our faith, especially in today's culture, uh, can be a little weird. But let me let me take the term, if I can, for just a minute. Today's culture. Somehow we we uh, convince ourselves that today's culture is more threatening and less accepting. If you remember the culture that the early church was in, not only was it was it a condemning crime or a condemnable crime to share your faith, the consequence of that crime was often your very own life and the life of your family. So you want to talk about a tough place to share your faith? How about the early church when Jesus left? That was a tough time. So today, what are you going to get if, they, if people, uh, you know, ostracize? Maybe people look at you funny. Maybe they don't invite you back out to their social gatherings. Don't be weird, but neither should we lack the courage to go to and share our faith. It's part of your design, right? It's part of your design. And so I hope you're asking the question, okay, well, I get that. You know, I can see the common ground. Uh, Maybe you like cooking. I'm going to invite some friends over for a barbecue and have a couple of conversations and then maybe look for the opportunity. So I know you see that, but where do I start? Well, the Bible says in Acts chapter one, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and unto the ends of the earth or the uttermost parts of 
the earth. So you see there in your notes where it says Jerusalem, you can look over to crossways and you can write there, write your own city. Where do you start? You start in your own city in the closest proximity to you. Maybe it's your workplace. Maybe it's the gym you go to. Uh, maybe it's the restaurant you frequent. There's an easy place to start. Start in Jerusalem. And then you go to Judea. Judea is your city or surroundabouts uh, or roundabouts that city. So your, your next level of, of influence, your outer circle. So you have an inner circle, but then you have an outer circle. Reach out to that region area. Then Samaria. And I love this about Samaria because a lot of people don't understand the Samaritans. But maybe you remember the story in John 4 where the woman came to Jesus. and She goes, hey, Jews and Samaritans, we don't even like each other. Jews and Samaritans, we don't even like each other. Well, I wonder today if there's a social group in the United States of America that doesn't like each other. Yeah, there is, isn't there? Matter of fact, there are plenty. And here's what Jesus is saying to us. Our Samaria are people who are culturally different from you, but who live in the same area. People who are culturally different than you, but live in the same area. Maybe there are some Hispanics that need Jesus that you could reach. Maybe there are some African Americans, some Caucasians. Maybe there's some Asians. Maybe there's some Muslims you could share your faith with. Maybe there's some Mormons you could share your faith with. Maybe there are some people who you may not necessarily get along in the cultural sense, but man, they could sure use the Jesus you have. And then finally, the ends of the earth is everybody else, whoever's left. Right. And you may say, Eli, you know, what would be my motivation for bringing people to Jesus and going to people to share Jesus? I'm glad you asked that because motivation is super important to why we do or if we're going to fulfill our destiny, our purpose and not quit and not be tired. You got to have the right motivation. So, number one, we do it because it is our responsibility. Here's what Luke says in chapter 12, verse 48. Much is required from those who much is given and their responsibility is greater. There's a responsibility on you and I because God's given us so much. God's done so much for us. There's a responsibility for us to go out and share the faith. I know we're in a society that shrugs responsibility, but I'm glad that you're here to discover what on earth you are here for. You can never accomplish great things without responsibility. So we got to make sure that we take the responsibility of sharing our faith with others. Here's the second motivation. We do it because we've been given authority. We've been given authority authority. The Bible says in Matthew 28, 18 and 19, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. In other words, he says the authority that's been given me, I'm going to give to you. Here's the go, right? Go and make disciples of all nations. You've been authorized. You have permission from the almighty. You have an, a, 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 if, you, if I will, a spiritual badge on your chest that allows you the opportunity to walk in the realm of sharing your faith. God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. That's Ephesians chapter one and verse 10. Will you do me a favor and just circle the word church there? Just circle the word church. I've shared this on our platform. I'd like to tell, I'd like to share it with you right now. The hope of the world doesn't lie in Congress. It doesn't lie in the White House. It doesn't lie in the intellectual minds of America's most brilliant people. The hope of the world lies in this small group of people we call the church. See, the church has been here before all that was instituted. And it'll be here when all of that is gone. The hope of the world is a group of people that gather just like they're gathered right now in your house. We didn't have temples. We didn't have churches back then. We would gather in people's homes just like you're doing right now to offer hope, strength. We began to live out our purpose in people's homes and lives began to transform and change as we discovered and lived out our purpose. The world was a better place. So I want you to know it's not anybody else. No psychologist, psychiatrist, politician has been given the authority to carry the good news. Only you and I, the church, have that authority. We do it because of history's number three. We do it because of history's inevitability. Inevitability. You may not know this, but Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 27 goes on, 26 and 27 goes on to say, I have a plan for the whole earth, for my mighty power reaches throughout the whole world. The Lord Almighty God has spoken. Who can change 
his plans. You know, um, I want to share, if I can for a moment, five global giants. The five global giants that are the world, not just America, the world is facing today is spiritual emptiness, self-centered leadership, poverty, disease, and illiteracy. Just, just look around you. Look around you. You'll find people who can be in church, who are out of the church, yet somehow they're spiritually empty. You'll find people in leadership, both political and spiritual, who are self-centered, seeking to only do their good and not good for the people around them. Look around you and you can see the poverty has absolutely stricken the world as we know it. I know a lot of rich people who are really poor inside. Disease, man, I can't begin to tell you how no matter how fast science progresses, it seems like disease runs a step faster than the ability of science to cover. And then illiteracy, it's all over the world. What is the church, this little small group? What is our role when we see these big, huge, five global giants? Well, for spiritual emptiness, God's called us to plant churches. Like that small group you're in right now, that small group is a little church that God is using. And there's churches all over and we need to plant more churches so that we can grow the kingdom and move forward and destroy this global giant of spiritual emptiness. What do we do for self-centered leadership? Well, we equip servant leaders. We help people who lead the way Jesus led and we give them opportunity and we create an atmosphere, an environment for them to grow and develop and affect the world. Please know this, the greatest leaders in America, the greatest leaders in the world have always been those who were closest to Christ. And then finally, when you talk about poverty, well, Jesus always assisted the poor. And the role of the church is to come alongside those who are poor and assist the poor. How about disease? We're the, the church. It's the church who cared for the sick. We were the ones who did this before anything ever happened. We created opportunities for people to come. And, and we were the first welfare. And we were the first hospitals. And we were the first place where people came and received sickness. And I think, again, the church can rise up to begin to do something about the sick. And then finally... What does the church do about illiteracy? The church educates the next generation. If we will begin to bring the truths of God's word and the truth of all the information we need, arithmetic, writing, history, all that's necessary, the church is available to help. Now you may say, Eli, I can't do all that. I know you can't. Man, I'm sure not asking you to take all these giants by themselves. As amazing as David was, he only killed one giant. He didn't kill them all. But you know what the church can do when we come together? We can destroy together spiritual emptiness, self-centeredness, poverty, disease, illiteracy. The church can destroy those one giant at a time. What on earth are you here for? At the end of the day, what difference does it make? Well, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, God doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants all of his people to change their hearts and lives. You know, I'm going to get a little serious here as I conclude our final talk. What would happen if we never go to? What would happen if the church never brings someone to Jesus? Here's what I know about you. I know you love yourself and I know you love the people around you. I know today if you had a hundred million dollars, you would probably be that person to buy somebody a house and to strengthen somebody and encourage somebody. I just know that in my heart that you're a great person. But we're not talking about money. We're not talking about houses. We're talking about eternity. Somebody's eternity will be forever with Jesus or forever away from Jesus. And the truth is, in these last few weeks, as we have learned and grown together, Jesus puts on us this great, awesome opportunity to share the good news with those who are lost. Don't stay silent. Don't stay in your sofa. Don't stay isolated in your hobby. Bring somebody with you.
Invite somebody into your home. Invite somebody to the golf course. Invite somebody to scrapbook with you. Whatever it is that you do, let's empty hell and fill heaven. Let's reach the broken with the one who can make them whole again and encourage them to live their dream and their purpose. I know with all my heart that what I'm saying to you right now is resonating in your heart and that your heart is pumping with the opportunity and the passion to change somebody's eternity. Don't stay still, get engaged, find a way, find a common ground and take some steps and watch what God, only God can begin to do in your life. Well, I pray these five purposes have become a reality to you in one way or another. And I know that as you get closer to God and you start moving forward, that God's going to continue to reveal all of his plan and his purposes specifically for your life. And so as we conclude, I just want to remind you really quick, you were made for worship. You were made for fellowship. You were made for discipleship. You were made for ministry. And you were made to share the gift of God. We call that evangelism. It's been an awesome joy to be with you. The truth is, I'm going to miss you. I know I haven't get to see every one of you, but doing this and being here with you, man, I'm going to miss you. So do me a favor. Make sure you come say hi to me on Sunday morning. Make sure you come put your arms around me because I'd love to give you a hug, a handshake, whatever it is that, that you would like. I want to hear your story. Remember, the website is mystory@changingpoint.com. Let me know what God's doing in your life. Celebrate this moment. Have an amazing conversation. And I can't wait to see the glory of God in your life as you live out what on earth you were here for. Let me pray for you. Father, today, I pray that all we have shared become a reality to the life of every believer. God, that you continue to stir our hearts for the very reason that you put us here. God, every one of us individual, every one of us distinct and unique. I pray, God, that you would just move out and move in those purposes through our life. Now, God, for anyone here today who maybe it's their first time or maybe through these weeks they've been coming and they've just, they've come to watch and hear and to learn. But maybe today, God, they're ready to take that step. God, and, and follow you for all of eternity. Lord, today I pray for the courage, God, that before this group is over, they'll reach out to this small group leader, God, and they'll make that step to cross over that line and step into the family of God to make sure they follow you for eternity. And God, today I thank you for a group of people who are gonna walk out their five purposes, God, to live out what you put them here on earth to do. Bless my friends, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'll see you Sunday.